That means one of his disciples has to do it. And since nobody else is doing it, I guess I'm, I'm going to have to do it. Even though I'm not very qualified, somehow or other I've been inspired to take up this work. Because how can any of us claim to be a spiritual master following in the footsteps of Srila Prabhupada if we haven't met his criteria? His criteria is, you should know Bhagavad Gita, Sri Yishupanishad, Srimad Bhagavatam, Nectar of Devotion, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and Vedanta Sutra. That's there in writing. It's there in black and white. Anybody can go in the Veda base and read it. That's Prabhupada's instruction. So, we want to implement those instructions that our God brothers didn't get around to or didn't feel that were important. And we want to please Srila Prabhupada by actually meeting his criteria of being a bona fide spiritual master. Therefore, we're going back and um, not translating, but we're editing the translations that were made by our God brother Kushakrata. And Kushakrata was um, a transcendental wild man. <laughs> uh, who decided to learn Sanskrit and he began uh, translating so many scriptures and actually translated uh, 150 different scriptures or something like this over a period of about 20 years. An amazing piece of work. Um, and somehow or other I got a hold of copies of all of his translations on disk. Um, and slowly I want to start bringing these out and adding them to our website and like that. It's going to take a lot of work because they all need editing. Uh, Kushikrata was a great translator and a great devotee, but he wasn't very um, careful about editing his books. So they contain a lot of typographical errors and stuff like that. Means that uh, someone has to go and clean them up. I actually approached him about this uh, a couple of different times. I said to him, you know, I really would like to be your editor and, and make all these books, you know, first class so that everybody will... Uh, and no, 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 no. He wouldn't work with anybody. He would, because I guess he had experience um, that working with devotees is a good way to scuttle any project. <laughs> so uh, he, he knew that he could be effective if he worked on his own. And I have to respect that because I have the same feeling. <laughs> and um, because I, I, I tried to work with other devotees for years and I wasn't able to make any progress until I went out on my own. Uh, so I respect his opinion. But now it's time to make more progress. We have to because we have to execute Srila Prabhupada's actual instruction. So I'm working on Vedanta Sutra. And the very first sutra is famous. Atato Brahma Jignasa. Atato means therefore, now. And Brahma Jignasa means we must inquire into Brahma. So what does this mean? Uh, people have written whole books on these four little words. <laughs> They're very, very deep and very, very profound. And I hope by explaining all this, you get a chance to see how Vedic knowledge works. Because Vedic knowledge gives, in a, in a very small amount of information, a great deal of wisdom. It's like compressed. You know, when you download a file from the internet, sometimes it's compressed. Uh, and then when you uncompress it, the, uh, the actual file is many times bigger. Uh, like MP3. MP3s are only one-tenth the size of the actual uh, sound files that they represent. It's compressed. So similarly, there's a lot of significance compressed into these four little words. Mm -hmm. Atta means therefore. If I say something beginning with therefore, blah, 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 
that means there's something that went before that. Uh, that statement is not existing in a vacuum or independently. It's in relation to something else. You know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, one, two, three, therefore, da, 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 da. So when Vedanta Sutra begins with, therefore, that means something it's in relationship to. Well, what is that? That is the four Vedas and the 108 Upanishads. Okay? Uh, the environment or the context in which the sutras of Vedanta uh, acquire their meaning is the Vedas and Upanishads. You cannot separate it. You cannot take it out of context. Or it loses all of its meaning. Not just some of it. All of it. Yeah. So the first thing we understand is that Vedanta Sutra has to be interpreted, has to be understood in the context of the Vedas and Upanishads. Otherwise it has no meaning. Yeah. It's just speculation. It's just our own random thoughts on the matter. <laughs> it has nothing to do with what Vyasadeva was thinking when he wrote it. Because what is the purpose of writing a scripture, a, a book, or even a note, or an email, or something? I have a thought in my head, and I want to communicate that same thought to someone else. So I write something, and then I send it to them. And when they read it, they have to decode what I wrote and then put it back together into the same thought that I had in mind when I wrote it. Uh, so what's the use if I write something and then I send it to somebody else and they get some completely different idea? Uh, that's not communication and that especially that is not philosophy or scripture. Because philosophy or scripture is supposed to have a definite meaning. It's not guesswork. It's not just your opinion or my opinion or anybody else. No, it has a particular definite meaning, a particular intention. Uh, just like mathematics. In mathematics, you can write a formula. And there's one correct way to understand that formula. It has to be understood in the proper context then you'll get the actual meaning. If you take that formula out of context, it could mean anything. We don't know what the terms of the formula mean unless they're defined by some kind of context. So similarly, the statements in Vedanta Sutra are defined by the context of the Vedas and Upanishads, and they have no meaning outside of it. So it always amazes me that people try to take the sutras, not only the Vedanta sutras, also the Yoga sutras, and so many other Vedic works, outside of the context of the Vedic literatures. And they try to understand them or interpret them in some completely different context. Uh, like especially the Yoga sutras are uh, being misused in this way all over the world today. It's very sad. Uh, because the Yoga Sutras are meant to exist in the context of the entire Vedic literature. Uh, and outside of that context, they really have no meaning. Uh, it's just like if you uh, turn on the radio and you're hearing the stock market report. AT&T 39.97, blah, 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 blah. If you know the context, Oh, AT&T is a company and they are in telecommunications and then the numbers after that are some kind of price and some indication whether it's going up or down. Uh, if you know that context, that background, then the report is meaningful to you. But if you don't know that, let's say, you know, you just came from the Brazilian jungle or something like that, and then you hear this on the radio, it's meaningless. It's gibberish, it's nonsense. And maybe you would assign some meaning to it out of your own context. Huh? Like, oh, this is a white man, medicine man. Huh? He's doing some spell, some incantation. 
Oh, I don't feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Maybe which doctor? <laughs> but uh, the actual meaning is something completely different. So this is what's happening to the Vedas and Vedic literatures as they're taken out of context of Vedic uh, life and culture and brought into the West. Uh, and we see people's so-called philosophy professors and people like this uh, studying Vedic literatures in a completely alien context like Western philosophy. And then there's, they're getting all these weird meanings that have nothing to do with the actual Vedic literature, with the Vedic culture. So we can understand this is bogus. So atta, now that you have read all the Vedas and the Upanishads, huh? Atta, 